come back to what David was saying, I think that there is a significant risk that TTIP will be used to preempt the normal <coughs> ordinary legislative process. And to cast data protection is a very good example. We're in the middle of negotiating the text. And then there is a risk that the whole process will be delayed because of TTIP. But then also the copyright is even more risky because it took us five years to get to the point of expecting a review, comprehensive review. And I'm really concerned that at the end, uh, the review will not be ambitious simply because many of the issues will be uh, thrown to the TTIP. I think they will wait, they will further delay at least a substantive copyright review. So the copyright directive, the exceptions and limitations, TTIP will be used as an excuse not to do anything until TTIP is concluded. And then on the other hand, there will be more push for the enforcement because enforcement uh, has been on the table for a long time. There is an instrument directed. So I think TTIP will see the balance again. It sounded like, I mean, I don't know if uh, Casas or, or Gail, and your, your story was almost that the, the negotiation itself has been providing an impetus to, to pass harmonization legislation where it didn't exist before. I mean, the, is there the dynamic that um, TTIP might act, not actually change EU legislation, but, but it provides the vehicle to change it in a way that wouldn't have changed if the negotiation wasn't happening as well in, in ways that we're concerned about? Well, well, typically, I mean, with trade secrets, it's difficult to, it's the egg and uh, chicken thing a little bit. But I mean, what's clear is that there is some, somewhere, some strong lobby pressure on both sides of the Atlantic. And so you see simul simultaneously the two administrations realizing that they should do something urgently on trade secrets. And it's in the tip, I mean, I don't know what's coming first, but, uh, and now we see that. Uh, TTIP is putting pressure on the procedure, the process inside of the parliament because, uh, well, I mean, if it was only for DG Trade, uh, I have no doubt they wouldn't really have problem going on their own, you know? I mean, they do that regularly, you know, it's not as if they were not doing that, like inventing things without the experts. And that's one of my response to, to David, you know? The question is, for me, who is drafting the EU, who is crafting the EU position on so many topics, you know? Okay, it is DG Trade together with a couple of people, uh, and there is the revolving door little problem here. Uh, but so that's a that's a big problem because uh, you know of course they say you know if you want to come up with a positive agenda they say well that's not what trade tra trade negotiation is. Uh, how what can we I mean if we want to talk I mean. One issue is patent harmonization. You know, it's been in the air for a while. We know that the US, they want to move with the grace period. The EU doesn't want that. The EU thinks that, okay, if it was in a broader context of patent harmonization, we could, you know, it, we could see. Patent harmonization is a big topic. You know, I don't, I, personally, I would be very afraid of seeing the trade people leading that discussion because they are not competent. Uh, so people don't, you know, people don't care so much when the EU is, you know, feeding Vietnam with whatever on intellectual property, you know, okay, we don't care so much. But here it's not exactly the same deal. And the, you know, the rhetoric of, oh, don't worry, it's not going to change anything, clearly we see the limit of that. It is changing. We are going to maybe have a trade secret regulation because we want you want it in the context of TTIP. So the problem for us is doing positive agenda things, uh, I, I really adapt, I mean, uh, on the patent issue, for instance, uh, we would have to talk with the patent office uh, or, and uh, DG Market. DG Market is the one who does, you know, or on copyright, you know, they are the one who are now working on the copyright review. Uh, we need to have very in intensive, detailed discussion. We don't need to discuss it with the crazy cowboys who, in any case, do not want to discuss with us. And also, frankly, they don't want to discuss with either the patent office or sometimes the colleague for Marx. That's and true. we hear that a lot. And I was talking with the people here, and this is kind of the same story. I mean, we know how it goes, you know, between the different institutions. It's not always very easy. So it's hard to think how the context of those negotiation could be a proper framework for us to try to, to promote positive, detailed positive agenda, principal things maybe like people try to do it in uh, TPP. Uh, 
Well, and I think that, uh, so more generally, uh, so, well, more generally, I mean, I think this is also asking questions to people, I don't know in the US, but I hope at least in Europe, about what those trade negotiations do. And I hope that people start to realize how much they can influence EU legal context and national legal context. Because again, we've been working on this for many years in the context of FTAs with country in the South. Um, people here, I mean, in Europe, you know, never really realized that uh, with an FTA, you know, it's a really interesting non-democratic way to change a lot of things. And um, maybe we can start to have a, a discussion about that. The problem we have, with, we have with TTIP also now is that it's sucking so much resources from everywhere because, you know, it's not only tons of people from the administration who have to get on board, you know, it's not only just uh, I mean, the industry, it's even us, you know, in, uh, we are a group of 50 MEPs, we have uh, uh, all our advisors on the different sectors have to be involved to follow up what's going on, even if we think that we think that this is probably going to last for a couple of years and then die because it's, it's not going to work, but still, you know, we have to work on it now. We have to try to figure out what's going on. We have to try to interfere. We have to elaborate position. So we're going to lose all this energy instead of, you know, concentrating on uh, on building positive alternative to the current problems that we already identified for years. So. And is there, before we move off of the EU, so the I mean, EU Parliament through series of resolutions over the, over the last years has tried to articulate uh, negotiating objectives for FTAs, for instance, on access to medicines, and there was the, there was the transparency that March 2010 we mentioned. Is, are there similar, first of all, most of those, and maybe all of them, have been non-binding resolutions. I don't know if any of them have been binding in the way the TPA would be binding, the Trade Promotion Authority bills would be binding here. But whether or not it's non-binding or binding resolutions, have, have there, are there similar efforts? I haven't heard of similar efforts around TTIP. Are those being discussed now? Is Parliament going to try to put forward a roadmap, or, or are people trying to promote that kind of a strategy? The way it's usually happening with uh, free trade in, at the Parliament is, I think, you know that here. Uh, I mean, just a, a limited group of member of the Parliament are going to follow the process of the negotiation and access some documents. Most of the uh, people, they, you know, it's not in the pipeline for, for them because it's only going to arrive when it's concluded and then they have to say yes or no. <laughs> so the resolution, you know, it gives an indication to them when they support or don't, not support the FTA, but traditionally they're supposed to support it, so it's not really having a strong impact. And uh, the problem is that the trade people are wide. And uh, so far we haven't uh, found a way to really function function with that. And it, it is a, becoming a very serious problem and I hope that uh, we are going to have a new trade commissioner in Europe now since you know, we had the elections and that's really t the type of question that we are going to push in the context of the audition of those people to try to get them to understand that uh, they have to function more collectively. If I can just answer to the well, provide some elements, you know, to the questions about access to knowledge and trade secrets. I think, yes, indeed, it would be really interesting to identify and be creative in trying to imagine where, from where the problem could, could come. But, um, I mean, or, or already we know that uh, there can be problems in access is government, government documents. As, as soon as the government is, you know, in, is in business with, with third third parties and the third parties can just be you know research agencies even even public research agencies but uh, trade secret can 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 be used in that context uh, but there is more generally you know the, the question of the the rights for the right to information uh, whether you know it's about safety uh, you know, whether it's safety reason or democratic reasons I mean we can think of many examples where access to different type of knowledge can be prevented. Jeremy? Maybe I'll address the question about the retroactive copyright extension. Mm -hmm. As far as I know, that is still on the table. Um, and you make the point that it doesn't make sense because there's no in ongoing incentive for works that have already been produced. But the error that you're making in your question is that you're being logical. 
Um, <laughs> there, there's no logic, this is pure rent seeking. And um, so one of the justifications that is sometimes given um, for this is that it provides the two generations of descendants. Um, but copyright was never intended as an inheritance plan. Um, that's not listed anywhere in the Berne Convention or in the copyright laws of the US Constitution. So um, we have to sort of attack this at its foundation and say, look, this doesn't make economic sense. There are legions of economists who will line up and say um, that this is a net welfare drain on the economy. Um, and so given that this is one of the live um, issues that are still in the TPP negotiations, and we do have two separate proposals on the table, um, one from the US and, and allied countries and the other from the developing countries, I think we really need to make a firm um, support of the developing country proposal, which is really just saying um, the copyright term is um, defined by your existing obligations under international law and, and bilateral agreements. So I think that's uh, a far preferable position for us to take. Uh, I just want to comment briefly um, on, the con uh, on the question on CPA. So I think we are in the moment to rethink uh, models of accountability regarding what US Char does. US Char is an independent agency. If they don't respond to anybody besides directly to the White House. And um, this puts a lot of issues in place and I think a lot of us has uh, has been following how much Congress representatives have been pushing back on that authority. Uh, but I think nobody has been taking seriously on how we should be developing better accountability mechanisms regarding what US Char thinks is their mandate to negotiate trade agreements specifically IP. And I think you are really right that the picture they have regarding IP is a wrong picture, right? It's not a, 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 a current picture anymore. If you think about the DMCA and the liquid version of the TPP from 2011, I think, um, the annex chapter actually detailed uh, in 10 or 15 pages how the DMCA procedure should work and we are exactly now discussing that same procedure. So I think uh, uh, we need to really give a step back and rethink a little bit uh, that, uh, that authority in terms of what, what should be their mandate and how Congress should be involved more directly into setting that agenda or, if necessary, revealing that agenda because we know how creativity is dynamic, how innovation is dynamic, and that agenda needs to match that uh, dynamic environment. So just that. Jim? On, on the copyright uh, term issue, um, if it's a work for hire and there's no individual which owns the right, if it's owned by a, a corporation, like films, for example, or the archives of the New York Times or things like that, um, then, you know, we, I mean, one thing we've suggested in the past is that they have a, um, they have different rules for things that are work for hire than they do for things that we can identify, you know, like if you're worried about some second or third generation people not having to have a job, if that's your, if that's your objective, then maybe you could, you know, narrow it down a bit. Um, I think that one of the probably more practical issues is can you introduce registration um, when you exceed the WTO terms on copyright for photographs and for and for, um, for copyright things. And I think that um, in the TPP there's been a proposal to understand it to permit countries if they extend their terms, to introduce formalities for the extended period. And I think that that's, that was part of the 2005 Access to Knowledge Treaty proposal to do that kind of thing. And I think that's actually, it's been considered in Europe and the United States. A lot of people think registration for the older works uh, is quite uh, qu quite a big mistake to move away from it. As you know, the US used to have registration for everything. Um, so it's feasible. Um, it solved a lot of problems. Um, I also think for, for people who sing songs, if you 
if you're a performer and you care about you know the creative people if you, if you sing a song and you do a cover of an old song you have to share your, your, your money your earnings as a, as a performer with the author of the song and if the author's been dead for you know like half a century already um, you might ask yourself uh, who benefits from the extended term because certainly the performer uh, it's a transfer of income from the performer uh, to the to the owners of the, the dead person's rights whoever you know I mean who owns Michael Jackson's rights these days or even the Beatles rights for example that's I mean I mean those things get transferred who knows and some yeah. owners rights so I think that Michael's not dead uh, <laughs> 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 Now, on, on, the, on, on the issue of uh, uh, Myra's question on, on like trade secrets, I mean, interoperability has always been fought as a trade secret issue. So when people try and reverse engineer and create interoperable products in the computer field and, re and, and sort of and sort of figure out what's going on in the software to create interoperable products, this is a, a, a really critical issue. So having space for um, uh, that's one area that's where it's fought out. Another area is. Uh, how do you how do you create biosimilar drugs? How do you basically determine how much can a, can a can a government require a company to disclose the way it manufactures a cancer drug, for example, if they don't want to have a permanent monopoly? Or same thing for diagnostics and things. So that you know, there's there's trade secrets, and there's a public interest at some point ending the monopoly on life-saving diagnostics and drugs. Um, there's all these health impact on chemicals and biologics, which are people trying to protect this trade. I could go on and on, but there's a lot out there. But I think a broader category, and I think a more risky category, is the confidential business information negotiations and things. Because then you don't have to meet the, the sort of very tough legal definition to be considered a trade secret. Pretty much, it's confidential business information, so whatever the government says is confidential business information. And that's just like forbidden information. That's just a, a, an anti-access to knowledge clause, and you ought to care how open-ended uh, and self-serving it is. It's confidential to the business for what reason? Is it confidential to the business because it's embarrassing to them? Because it creates more competition? Because it reveals information about the mediocre quality of their products or the dangerous quality of their products? I mean, you have to kind of ask yourself, why would you not want that to be transparent? I think the standard for saying something is legally protected. I mean, companies can try and keep you from getting information. Nobody complains, you know, nobody says that can't take place. But they want a special state-backed legal action and regulation of confidential business and, and fines and everything else associated with it, third-party liability. That's a mess. Finally, David asked about this uh, two-day meeting. The proposal was, and I, I, I talked uh, to the FLCO about this meeting, uh, about this discussion. They, uh, I, I proposed kind of off the cuff at this meeting we had yesterday. I said, why don't, because uh, Dan Maloney, the chief negotiator, he's not the right guy to ask, of course, but I said, what, can you have a two-day meeting about what the social agenda should be for the TTIP? Because people were coming up in different parts of the meetings with like good ideas for positive things you could have. In, 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 a, in a trade agreement. I mean, people mentioned like uh, the Marrakesh Treaty about uh, making it easier to move works for blind people across borders. Other people would like to have cooperation in funding clinical trials or independent to look at the safety and efficacy of drugs. Maybe there would be some um, uh, idea of access to government funded research like what the NIH does. Maybe that could be globalized a bit. There's sort of a whole series of areas of the trade related aspects of of, of knowledge as a public good, which could be developed, but also <clears throat> maybe people talk about tax avoidance, environmental standards, labor standards, like quite a few different things. So he said, why not you just have two days and people come in and just sort of put on the table all the ideas of if, if the trade agreements were not for big companies, but if they were for people, what would it look like? You know, and just sort of, just as a brainstorming exercise, just to sort of have that kind of conversation. And clearly, uh, there was the Martian problem that David referred to, that like they, they didn't quite understand why anyone would put those words together in that particular sequence and express such a ridiculous idea. It just seems so like, huh? You know, uh, but I mean, I think that... I, it, it, yeah, exactly, but I mean, if you think about it, I mean, trade agreements, it's not true that trade agreements are not supposed to have a social purpose. Trade agreements are all justified as having a social purpose. But they're all done in secret in these little collaborations with the chamber and stuff like that. I think that uh, it would be really uh, uh, good for us to really push 
uh, Michael Froman, not, not the chief negotiator, doesn't have the imagination and leadership qualities to move on something like this. But I would, I would sort of uh, go to Michael Froman, who fancies himself as a renaissance man and an intellectual and uh, future philanthropist or whatever like that. I would sort of go to him and say, Michael Froman, why don't you basically give us these two days you spend so many days clustered with business organizations, like in full body contact, you know, year round. You know, maybe you can you can, you can try to do, do this. Well, uh, I mean, I mean, based on the press releases they put out of all the meet and greets, he's constantly in. You know, so uh, yeah, give us these two days and see what we can come up with. Thank you. Great. Okay, so thank you to the panel. That was great.